Our next talk, David Namek uh, from the Pequot Museum and also a grad student at Clark University who will be giving a paper called The Pequot Wars, Keith's War and the Decade of Conflict, 1635 to 1645. Thank you very much. I'll be uh, reading from the paper, having some images to uh, take a look at to keep us busy. Uh, but during the 17th century, the lives of Native Americans and Europeans in the Northeast became ever increasingly entangled through sustained contact. Rising tensions resulted in several successive conflicts, the likes of which have never been encountered before in the region. The most prominent of these, uh, known today, is the Dutch Pequot War, 1633-34, the Pequot War, 36-37, Keefe's War, 1640-45. During each conflict, Native and European forces adopted their culturally specific military tactics, command structures, equipment to combat their enemies. These wars are acknowledged as watershed moments for the people of the region, but are typically viewed as unrelated events. These, uh, this paper considers some of the relationships between them, paying particular attention to how the combatants modify their tactics based on their experiences. Furthermore, it considers how European colonizers learned from each other battling the Pequot, and how English dominance following the Pequot War may have inspired Dutch policies in the New Netherlands thereafter. These interrelated military political events constitute a decade of conflict lasting roughly from 1634 to 1644. These conflicts are best understood within the broader cultural, political, and economic changes that occurred within the region following the arrival of the Europeans. Native peoples introduced Europeans to the sacred white whelk and purple quahog shell beads, known as swamp by the Munsi or wampum by Eastern Algonquins. The significance of wampum was not fully understood by Europeans, but they documented its usage in diplomacy, trade, art, funerary practices. Around 1620, the Dutch understood the trade potential of wampum and treated it as a valuable commodity, increasing demand for it throughout the region. Corresponding with European demands for wampum was Pequot political and military expansion in the Long Island Basin. By 1620, the Pequot increased their influence over the region and soon controlled much of the fur and wampum trade. Dutch traders increasingly used wampum to procure furs, and in 1626, the West India Company, WIC, initiated a trade alliance with the Pequot for the valuable commodity in return for European trade goods. The Dutch and Pequot controlled much of the wampum and fur trade, resulting in a relatively stable, though potentially volatile, situation. In 1628, the Dutch shared the significance of wampum uh, with the English at Plymouth in the hopes that they could profit as the sole provider, supplier. This attracted English traders to Long Island Sound in search of wampum, and by 1630, they appeared in the Connecticut River Valley. To prevent English encroachment, Jacob Van Kruller traveled to Pequot Territory in June 1633 and negotiated a deed for land on the Fresh River, Connecticut, with the Pequot's Grand Sachem, and soon thereafter erected the House of Hope trading post. It is unclear how the Dutch Pequot Alliance collapsed later that year, resulting in war, but the most frequently cited account states that the Pequot attacked the Narragansett trading expedition near the House of Good Hope, for neglect, neglecting to pay tribute uh, to trade with the Dutch. It appears that the roots of the war centered on the Dutch insistence upon a free trade zone. Little is known about the short-lived Dutch Pequot War, but it was first between Europeans and natives in the Long Island Basin. During this conflict, the Pequot appear to have fought in large formations on open ground as they had against native opponents. The Pequot employed such battle tactics uh, against natives in the Connecticut River Valley in the 1620s. Pequot and Wangunk, quote, sachems, agreed to meet and fight in the field, each with their entire force, unquote, and they fought, uh, quote, several pitched battles. The Wangunk were defeated and became tributaries to the Pequot. This type of fighting was similar to accounts of pre-contact Mohawk assaults and is consistent with Champlain's description of native combat. Glimpses of early Pequot warfare survive in English sources. John Winthrop wrote that during the August 1636 raids against the Manicene and the Pequot, English commanders expected them to stand and fight in the open as they had against the Dutch. At Pequot, he stated that English forces, quote, marched after them, supposing they would have stood it a while as they did the Dutch, unquote. During the attack on Block Island, Captain John Underhill wrote that, quote, we thought they would stand it out with us, but they perceiving we were in earnest fled. Based on these accounts, it is clear that the Pequot quickly abandoned tactics which proved ineffective against Dutch pike and shock formations honed during the Thirty Years' War. Pequot battle tactics, which had been so effective against other natives, were less formidable against Dutch arms and armor and were adjusted to negate uh, these advantages. Pequot leaders transitioned from massed forces to smaller fighting units, and warriors engaged their enemies just beyond effective musket range, 100 to 125 yards, uh, with volleys of arrows fired in groups of 10 or more. The acquisition of firearm technology through trader capture may have impacted Pequot military tactics as well. 
Uh, as a result of this war, Pequot leaders avoided large engagements in open fields, relied on siege strategies, guerrilla warfare, and coordinated ambush to counter superior European armaments. As the war progressed, the Dutch seized the Pequot Sachem Tatoban under pretense of trade, and although a large sum of wampum was paid, the Dutch uh, executed their hostage. The only known Pequot retaliation for this occurred in January 1634, when the Pequot mistook John Stone's English vessel for a Dutch ship, killed all aboard north of Saber Point. Fighting later erupted in the Pequot Narragansett border, relieving pressure from the Dutch, and further exacerbating tensions in the region was a smallpox epidemic that spread to the Connecticut River, decimating Native communities. It's unclear how or when the war ended, but the two sides had restored trade relations by 1635. By the time of the Pequot War, 1636 to 37, many Pequot warriors were now combat veterans, well aware of the capabilities and limitations of European arms and armor. When the conflict began in late 1636, the English discovered that native forces utilized open order tactics, advanced in small groups of a dozen or less, and attacked beyond musket range. As mentioned earlier, English leaders were apparently unaware of these newly developed tactics when they plotted to invade the Pequot homeland in August, uh, and leaders assumed that they would stand and fight as they did against the Dutch. Stone's killing is usually cited as the event which led to the Pequot War, however, it was the accumulation of growing tensions within the region. English traders competed with the Dutch for native clientele as they established settlements along the Connecticut River between 1633 and 35. July 36, John Oldham, trader of Wethersfield, is murdered by the Manasseans off Block Island, provoking the Massachusetts Bay to, re to retaliate with a punitive expedition. On August 24th, they invaded, burned several villages, destroyed food stores on, on Block Island before proceeding unannounced to the Pequot River, where they ultimately destroyed two more villages after demanding Stone's killers. The Pequot viewed this as an unprovoked attack and immediately assaulted the English at Saybrook Fort. English commanders expected to engage native warriors en masse and on open field of battle as the Dutch had experienced. To the contrary, English force experienced low combat at Pequot until Massachusetts Bay deserted, a contingent of Saybrook settlers sent by Lion Garter to capture corn. Once the Pequot had the numerical advantage, they attacked Gardner's men in groups of ten beyond musket range, firing volleys of arrows, quote, at compass, or high in the air against their enemy. They immediately took cover, dodging gunfire, while another team of warriors advanced to give fire. This continued for hours until the English retreated. Throughout the winter of 1636-37, Pequot forces utilized their new tactics honed during the war with the Dutch. Pequot allied warriors laid siege to the garrison at Saybrook Fort, and Gardner's command was constantly assaulted by warriors in well-orchestrated ambushes, and English casualties quickly mounted. The Pequot assaulted English river traffic, as they had during the last war, and Gardner made several references to warriors utilizing firearms against his garrison, stating that, quote, they shoot our own pieces against us. Unquote. It is well documented that the Pequot were armed with a dozen or so firearms, but likely had many more. It is unknown how they distributed or deployed their weapons, but Gardner is clear that his men were shot at by Pequot marksmen, and this fact was not lost upon Captain John Mason. This impacted his decision to deviate from his original orders to assault Pequot villages along the steep banks of the Pequot River. Even though the Pequot secured a nominal supply of firearms, they desperately lacked gunpowder, confirmed by the English girls captured at Wethersfield, who were pressured to produce the substance. The Wethersfield raid terrified the English, and on May 1st, 1637, the court at Hartford ordered a defensive war against the Pequot. The English mobilized 90 men and around 100 River Indians, augmented with 20 Mass Bay forces and some of Gardner's veterans. English commanders opted for against a frontal assault against the Pequot, adopted a Narragansett derived battle plan in which they suggested in Narragansett that the English prepare for a month-long campaign, beginning with a sneak attack from the east suggested that they surround them in their forts, cut off any escape routes nearby swamps, and assault fortified villages in full armor. English allied forces sailed the Narragansett Bay, where Narragansett and eastern Niantic warriors joined them. The combined force of nearly 400 men assaulted the Pequot fortified village, village at Mystic on the morning of May 26, which contained about 150 warriors, 250 to 300 non-combatants. This attack forced Pequot warriors in to fight in close quarters, which negated their ability to employ their newly effective tactics and gave English the advantage in terms of arms and armor. Nonetheless, the severely outnumbered English attackers suffered nearly 50% casualties in 15 minutes, prompting Mason to set the village ablaze. The Battle of Mystic Fort became a massacre as Pequot warriors and nearly all non-combatants perished in the ensuing inferno in combat. Hundreds of warriors mobilized from surrounding villages but arrived too late to affect the outcome of the battle. Tried Pequot battle tactics were abandoned as enraged warriors threw themselves against the invaders. Sassacus launched some organized counterattacks against the withdrawing English allied forces who marched to their ships at the Pequot River, uh, at Pequot Harbor. 
The Pequot reportedly lost as many men during this action as they had during the Mystic Massacre, and the combined losses impacted their ability to prosecute the war. Even so, the Pequot resisted for three more months until English Allied forces sailed into eastern New Netherland and battled the remnant Pequot forces at the Pequot Swamp, 20 miles west of Quinnipiac. The English considered the war over when they received evidence of Sassacus's death in September. The Dutch were unprepared for the speed in which the English solidified their presence in the region by claiming Pequot territory through conquest. The English superseded the Pequot and rivaled the Dutch and uh, Narragansett as the dominant economic military power in the region. Eastern New Netherlands effectively became New England as English colonists flocked to the River Valley and beyond. Dutch leaders in New Amsterdam appear to gather their own lessons from the successful English wartime strategies and post-war policies. In 1638, Director Willem Keith arrived in New Netherlands and found the colony close to economic disaster. The WIC issued new articles and conditions in January 39 to encourage the settler population by eliminating company fur trade monopolies, encouraging free trade, granting acres of land to new settlers. In anticipation of new settlers, Keith secured new land deeds and sought to improve fortifications. To defray expenses, he focused on extracting valuable good from Muncie communities through force, it is if necessary. It is unclear what triggered the dramatic shift in policy, but it, is clear, it appears closely modeled after indigenous tributary practices and was essentially the tribute imposed by the English on Pequot survivors and their former tributaries. Tensions mounted over, mounted over Keith's policies and few, if any, groups paid the tax, which would have acknowledged Dutch, Dutch authority over them. The failure to con collect con contributions resulted in violence, and in 1640, uh, Dutch personnel were assaulted at a rare town village while attempting to take corn as a contribution. Keith responded with force, ordering a punitive expedition against Staten Island to demand reparations and contribution. The resulting massacre was the first of many what would become known as Keith's War Against the Indians. The heavy-handed response was contrary to company policy and resembled English reprisals against the Pequot in 36 and the 39 expedition against the Pequot at Pogatuck. If the intent of the Dutch expedition was to intimidate native groups uh, into a forced tributary status through force, it failed. Tensions escalated when Rotan warriors retaliated against settlements. Keith quickly negotiated military alliances with Western Long Island Algonquin groups and offered bounties on heads as the English had done in the Pequot War. As the Dutch forces battled the Raritan, violence escalated with a Kukwikizuk Indian killed the Dutchman to avenge the, Dutch, uh, avenge the death of his family members. Keith's council authorized military reprisals, but Dutch soldiers were unable to locate the enemy. But the expedition achieved uh, its goal as the Kukwikizuk quickly sued for peace after learning of the offensive, but never surrendered the murder Keith saw. In the winter of 43, the Dutch were handed an opportunity for re re revenge when the Mohawk or Mohegan forces drove the Wakwegazik south to the Dutch for protection. February 26, Keith and his supporters authorized an attack on refugee encampments around New Amsterdam, massacring at least 80. Keith may have expected the massacres to serve as a dramatic lesson similar to Mystic Fort, but the killing of unarmed refugees galvanized at least 11 native communities, and the Muncie mobilized an estimated 1,500 men uh, who inflicted severe casualties on the Dutch. The Dutch were forced to fight a very different war than the English neighbors had six years earlier. Pequot reliance on tributary warriors hastened their defeat following the English victory at Mystic as the Pequot Confederacy crumbled and former tributary allies turned against them or submitted to the English. Muncie forces battled the Dutch and were not under a centralized command, as was the case with the Pequot. And defeating any one tribe would not end the war. Uh, <clears throat> Muncie groups were well armed. Uh, every native community would have to be defeated individually. To further complicate the war effort, Muncie groups were well armed. Dutch accounts estimate at least 400 trade guns had been sold to the natives by 1644. As the conflict escalated, English volunteers were recruited in 43, including Underhill to command Dutch Anglo forces, which put native warriors on the defensive by targeting food stores and villages. Every new massacre produced far different results in Mystic Fort, which had inflicted such heavy physical and psychological toll on the Pequot, who evacuated the country and lost their tributaries. By 1645, massacres authorized by Keith incited dozens of native groups, unlike the English who only battled one or two major adversaries. Despite recent Dutch Anglo victories, there appeared to be no end of the war in sight. Native diplomacy achieved what European force could not, and hostilities ceased in July 1645, thanks to Mohawk mediators who convinced the Muncie to agree to a ceasefire. Keith's war ended on August 30th, 1645, but the damage had been done. Over a thousand natives had perished along with an unknown number of Europeans. The Dutch found themselves in a precarious situation. New Netherlands was financially crippled and too weak to effectively challenge future English incursions. 
They were forced to adopt an appeasement policy with the Muncie in order to prevent future conflict, where Captain Edward Johnson of Massachusetts Bay, writing in 1654, claimed that the Pequot War, quote, struck a trembling ter terror in all Indians round about, even to this day, unquote. Keith's adversary counsel blamed him for the situation and successfully petitioned for his removal in late 64. When the new director, Peter Sturvesant, arrived in 1647, Keith's war had left the Netherlands in ruins. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.